Well, the idea for the film came from the fact that I was working on a river that was very, very visual. Um, I'd fished all my life in different rivers all over the country where you didn't really see what was going on. But when I came to work here at Uig Lodge on the Fossa River, um, I noticed that you could see the fish taking the fly. You could observe them in the sea, in the river quite easily and thought other people must want to see this. Um, I had no experience of filming, writing, anything. Um, but I did know Jed. Well, I didn't know Jed, but I knew people who knew Jed. And one day he was stopped at traffic lights um, because they were resurfacing the road. And I ran out through the rain, tapped on the window and said, you don't know me, but would you like to make a film about fishing? Um, and it started there. The idea initially was nothing like the finished film. Probably nowhere near as good. It, it was going to be sort of an, an educational thing for salmon fishermen. Um, so that they could see how the fish behave in the water, learn about the fish to then help them catch more fish. But in the end, um, the footage was almost too good just to use it for that. And it seemed that lots of people who weren't fishermen or fisherwomen uh, also enjoyed watching it because there's a lot of beautiful scenery, wildlife, the fish are very graceful. And so it sort of built from there and turned into what it is now. After the, the day I went and tapped on, on Jed's window um, and asked if he'd like to make a film, I went around to introduce myself um, with a little A5 notepad um, with notes on about how I envisage scenes going into other scenes, uh, which looking back was very naive. It was very, very simple and probably had about five minutes of footage, but I thought that was a whole film. Um, so we, we sort of started filming the first week right away there was sort of a bit of enthusiasm in there and we had help from friends who had you know uh, snorkels and masks and things but we didn't get any good footage at all and I always thought it was going to take three or four years to film uh, Jed thought it would be quicker but of course I knew the fish better and knew that they don't cooperate and that quite often you'll go and try and film something and it just doesn't happen I mean this is why the BBC wildlife or whatever has huge budgets because it takes months and months to get maybe a minute of footage. Um, so we, we, we started off quite quickly, but didn't get very much for the first year, really, apart from some lovely shots of the salmon swimming over the beach, because it was quite a hot year and very dry and still. So we filmed a lot of um, salmon swimming on the sand, uh, which is in the film. You'll see that there. The film kept changing because, really, there's been no director to the film, other than the fish themselves, I guess. So we had to take direction from them. And because that took so long, a lot of people saw some of the footage and then had their input. And um, hmm, we just changed our minds, really, on what was going to happen. In fact, from week to week, we changed our mind what was going to happen. And the script wasn't written until after we'd collected over 50 hours of footage. And then we looked at it and thought, right, well, you know, this is the story we can tell with this, um, which is 95% to the exact story I'd want to tell. You know, that you'll never get anything perfect in any film. Um, and there, you can always make changes, and even though now it's finished, I would change two or three shots. Um, Jed would change two or three shots a different way. And no doubt friends and, and people who've been interviewed on, on the film would change other shots slightly. So you have to settle for something that's just right and and this is where we finished it and we've done it and you know we're pretty pleased with it there are lots of high and low points um, some of the high points you could look at as low points I mean a high point for me was filming the salmon in the spawning beds which people won't know but that was me in a Gore-Tex dry suit that leaked in four degrees centigrade water for two hours a day for about two weeks and I did that over two years um, just to get that footage and I just had to lie there and wait for the fish to come to me um, which doesn't sound difficult but it's, it was cold I, I, I knew I had to get out of the water when um, I couldn't move anymore which is a sign of hypothermia coming on I think so I'd, I'd know right I can't move my arms best to get out of the water now and I'd come back the next day and film there was a high point for me filming some wonderful stuff underwater and then realizing I'd clocked the wrong button on the camera and hadn't been recording or 
had got it out of focus or something. So there's lots of footage that nobody will ever see that is wonderful. If only you could, you could see it. Um, in my head, it was wonderful. Uh, another high point was one of the days fishing in the, um, the Bruton Stream with Malcolm Green, where we caught 10 salmon. Uh, we didn't show all these being caught on the film. Uh, in fact, I think Jed had to go back for his tea halfway through. But it was a great day's fishing, and I really enjoyed that. And also the people we met and spoke to, um, and the reaction you get from people who've seen the footage has always been very good. That's a high point. I mean, that, there's no point doing anything unless um, it makes people happy, including yourself. So that, that's a high point. Um, but the low points are all to do with me messing up underwater filming, really, or just being in the wrong place um, at the right time or the right place at the wrong time. I know we had to film the fish leaping the falls um, because we were an hour late. It, we had to wait another year to get that shot um, because it's a small river and people might think the fish are leaping the falls like this all the time, but they're not. It only happens in daylight for a few hours every year. And that was frustrating. But at the end of the day, it's been a labor of love, so it all worked out in the end. The most remarkable point from my point of view being just a simple gilly is learning about how all the technology works and how to actually put a film together. It's, there's a huge difference from what you think on an A5 notepad piece of paper as to how you make a film and to actually what goes into it. From the sound, um, you have stereo sound, you know, and you, um, the, the shots, which shots work together and which ones don't. Um, basically that, the technical side, the editing, um, and the production has been you know, the biggest learning curve for me. But luckily, with Jed, um, he's you know, done all that, really. And I've just been there in the background. Um, remarkable things on the film, I think. I mean, Araminta Lowe's first salmon um, is, is quite something on the film. Um, people probably watching this will already have seen it. And that was her first salmon from a rock pool, basically, on the beach. And you can see it come and take. And she actually tells the story very well later on, without having seen the footage. And um, you know, it's quite something the way it came out at the fly and went for it, missed it, and then came again. Quite a spectacular fish for a first one. So I loved that. But also I loved filming the salmon underwater, um, which, for those who might wonder how I did it, it wasn't with a scuba gear. I had very mixed results with scuba gear, because I kept sinking and floating and not doing it very well. But it was done with a snorkel and a mask. And they were fish in a shoal in the sea, just wild. I just floated up to them one day, and they didn't get scared. And to see that was just incredible. Um, it's just a shame that the camera housing had a hole in it, so I had to hold it at the top of the water. I couldn't actually do more. I could have filmed there for hours and hours all day. But by the end of the filming, because I came out and showed people the footage on the camera, um, there were people going in their underpants, fishermen, <laughs> swimming in there to see. So that was quite a fun day. Um, of course, you don't see that on the, on the film, but um, that, was, that was a high point as well. We were very lucky in being able to make the film in that we had free reign over a whole river system for as long as we wanted, which turned out to be about six years, I think. Um, Malcolm and Barry Green, the owners, and Kenny Mackay, the um, manager there, were all very, very supportive and helpful. And even though I was meant to be working a lot of the time because I was the ghillie, um, they didn't mind me taking minutes aside to go and you know, instruct Jed as to what we we're doing and what we were trying to capture on film that day. Um, they've been great. And I guess at the end of the day, they've got something good as well. They can take it home and watch it in the winter time and remember what it's like to be here in the summer. Um, and in fact, they haven't at this point seen the final film. So um, I think that's going to be a a nice evening, maybe a party, a whiskey or two with that. During the filming, there were lots of incidents um, that, again, you won't see on film that were quite amusing to us, sort of private jokes, really. When we watch the film now, I, can, I remember what happened. There was one day in particular where I'd been instructing Jed how careful we have to be near the riverbank to film the salmon spawning, um, because he was filming from above the water and I was going to be lying in the river with a camera filming the same thing from two different angles so we could cut them together. And I remember we snuck up very carefully, spent ages sneaking along the bank, setting the, the uh, main camera up. 
And then I proceeded to sneak along the bank and then slipped and fell in with a great splash um, into the pool. We, perhaps we should have left that in, but we um, obviously edited that out. So all you see now is a very smooth transitional shot that looks as though it was perfectly set up. Um, there were other things that were, were quite amusing too. I mean, people getting hooks stuck in them and things when I mean, we turned the cameras off out of politeness, but it probably would have made very good television. Um, and losing fish. I mean, there's been some edited out language, I think, from time to time where uh, things don't go quite to plan. Because, of course, the people are fishing, including myself. Um, they're living it. They're actually doing it. This isn't uh, an a any acting in here. This is you know, a fly-in-the-wall documentary type thing, really. So if somebody is annoyed at losing a fish, which most people are, they, they showed it, but uh, nobody else can see that. Well, I didn't really know anything at all about salmon. And uh, even after six years, I probably still don't. <laughs> no, they, what started, I was, they were resurfacing the road when uh, Richard, who I didn't know at the time, decided he was going to uh, come across and put this idea to me about making a film. I, I just saw this guy running past all the roadworks, then knocking on the window and then saying, how do you fancy making a film about salmon? He said, I've got the knowledge and you've got the gear. So. So that was it. He came round to the house, put forward a proposal, and uh, we kind of liked Richard, so we just went with it because uh, uh, my partner was heavily involved in uh, the decision. So, so little did I know what lay in store. And I've lived in this area for since 1988, and I had no idea you could just see all these salmon. Summer after summer, I've missed them all. But uh, so it's quite incredible, quite good to film, and it's a beautiful area. Uig Bay is a fantastic location. I mean, you couldn't ask for a better backdrop for a film. Probably the biggest high was finishing it. <laughs> no, no, the, no I, I enjoyed the sort of moment. Because obviously we, Richard and me have got very different ways of working. And uh, like Richard's kind of a, an idea will occur to him and he'll go with it. He's a doer rather than a talker, you know, so that's quite interesting. Well, it's, um, and also the biggest thing I hadn't realised was Richard had said at the beginning that there were to be like no spoof catches. Every catch captured had to be a real take on camera, not, not a fake one, which television does quite a lot. And I'd sort of said, oh yeah, yeah, no problem. Right, and uh, little did I know. And at that time the camera I was using, it meant you had to just keep recording all the time, following the line and everything, and uh, until someone caught one. And you could go through, the tapes were only 24 minutes long, and uh, you could go through like hours of tape I think the lows were just kind of like, um, I had to fit this in around my normal filming work. Uh, I do a lot of work for like BBC Scotland, which involves travelling throughout Europe, and uh, something good would be coming up from Richard's point of view, and then I'd get a call to like go to Turkey or go and cover the elections in Cyprus and things, which is great, but uh, frustrating for him. And I'd get back to find out all the great shots we'd missed, so we have to wait till another year. I've learned quite a lot about salmon, and I know I wouldn't want to be one. <laughs> it's a tough life cycle, and everyone's after you, from fish and seals out in the sea to people trying to catch you when you come ashore. and Then you've got all this arduous, torturous process to reproduce. When you go through all that, you just die. You know, who'd bear salmon? Yeah. Some of the lows have been um, yeah, just being out in miserable weather, which like for filming, I love beautiful days. Like there was one day in Uig Bay which was beautiful and fantastic colours and great for the camera and pleasant to be out. And Richard just thought this was a terrible day, you know. And I'm thinking this is fantastic, you know, it looks beautiful. And he's, he's there saying this is awful. You know? <laughs> you know, so it took me a while to get used to like good for fishing isn't necessarily good for filming, you know. So the lows were kind of having to go out in the dreadful weather and can't, you know, film people attempting to catch fish, which they didn't always do. You know. But one thing I really did enjoy was all the excuses fishermen come out with. They're just full of them. You know. you know, I just wasn't aware of that. One good thing about making the film has been uh, we did get a lot of help from people, especially the owners of the UIG, the fishing on the Fossa River, you know, Malcolm and Barry Green. They were great, especially uh, Malcolm was always willing to be filmed and have the hassle of uh, just hang on a minute while I get a shot of this and all that kind of thing. So he, he was up for that. And, his brother Barry was, uh, w you know, he got some good catches on in 
for me, beautiful weather, so I was quite chuffed about that. So. And also, we went to the Grimister River system, and uh, the manager there, Simon Scott, he was, he was really very, very helpful for filming purposes, because not all the film has been shot in, on the Fossa, some of it's been shot at Grimister, which is quite a famous salmon river, but uh, it was great that he gave us access to film there, and uh, we got quite a few catches there, so uh, to, that was good from my point of view. And we got a couple of uh, interesting characters to interview there who I quite enjoyed filming. So. When we were making this film, it wasn't made in the conventional way of like with the crew and the director and the producer back at base. Basically, Richard and me were the producers. So, uh, and Richard kind of had, he knew fish and what to get, but he'd never made a film before. And I'd never made a film about salmon. Most of the films I made was shot in controlled timescales, like five days on location and you had to get everything you needed where this was an open-ended book with the, well, obviously with Richard's brief of everything had to be real so <laughs> and also we, at some point we decided we wanted good underwater shots now I, I don't do underwater but Richard took this on board and he's the guy who uh, I remember arriving at the river one day it was the first week of December it was snowing the road was icy and I, I heard he was up at the river so I'd gone up and I just saw this figure sat in 18 inches of water, looking transparent, you know, trying to tell me about these shots he'd got. All I got was, going, ooh, ooh, you know, it's like, so I thought, oh God, he's going to get hypothermia here, you know, all this for a salmon shot. But he did get some great shots, especially underneath the falls in the summer. I was quite chuffed with them. So. The shots he got that were quite amazing but disappointing from Richard's point of view were, um, a shoal had arrived in the bay from the sea. Now, I don't think this had been filmed before, so he'd gone in with the DV camera, but the bag had a hole in it, which meant he couldn't submerge it. So he had to keep the back end of the camera above the surface, and obviously you've got the swell and the waves, but, and he's trying to get all these fish, but he still managed to get some good stuff, but I, I can just imagine the frustration. You know. You know, people like the shots, but he personally was very frustrated. You know. Oh, the lock. That was, you know, another one. What used to happen was Richard would phone me up and, uh, like, because I only live five minutes away from where we were filming, so uh, it was a case of, like, be on call almost. And uh, he'd got a day fishing on the lock, on the lock and uh, which meant going out in his little rowing boat. But I'd done my back in the day before and I could hardly pick the camera up, you know. And, and the prospect of going wasn't very good. But I went down there anyway because he's such an, he's quite enthusiastic, so... It fires you up a bit, and I couldn't even get like my Wellingtons on. <laughs> couldn't bend over. But managed to get in the boat, but that was quite a good day. At first, we didn't think anything was going to get caught, but uh, it caught quite a lot. But it was frustrating to film because you're stuck in the back of a boat. There's no cutaway shots from other angles, you know. And I was, I was a bit worried that sequence wasn't going to work, and uh, we did have trouble when we were doing the offline cut. But uh, Angus Mackay, who did the online edit, was. Uh, was brilliant. He really managed to put it all together. But even so, the sound, because I'd had a cover on the camera and I was using the camera audio, it was, the sound was rubbish, you know, absolutely rubbish. You know. But uh, we went to this dubbing studio in Glasgow and the, the dubbing engineer, Dave Murray, I just couldn't believe it. You know, He brought the whole sequence alive. So thank you, uh, Angus, and thank you, Dave. We love you. you know. I think the best thing I've enjoyed most about the film and the salmon is eating them. <laughs>